most of us tend to know that there was a tragedy in Gambia. Uh, that is, that entire controversy uh, is affecting you know, our pharma industry, and therefore there is a huge role you know, <laughs> to now correct, if at all, or do whatever different strategies that they can adopt. And therefore, Dr. Somani could not come. Fortunately, I had an opportunity to work closely with DCGI since uh, 2015. And later, perhaps, you know, during COVID times, our relationships had to be very strong. Now, we try to learn. I was told that I could speak on COVID and DCGI and how, what kind of strategies people had to adopt, because this is one of the most interesting areas. You know? One thing which we have to realize is we had all kinds of regulations for, for any other setting other than public health emergency uh, at this juncture. The second thing which we had, to, we have also got to understand is there was a kind of a dry run that we had. Uh, there was a Nipah outbreak sometime in May 2018 in Kerala. And none of us could understand how it has reached Kerala. And we had a very short period of time. It lasted only for 15 days or so. But we had to move very rapidly. One of the things which we also know that uh, Nipah is highly contagious virus. Uh, and if somebody acquires it, the mortality rates that we had were 90%. And there was a fear of bioterrorism that perhaps this could also be due to bioterrorism. So our movements were pretty fast at that particular juncture. And there were two things which suddenly came to the light. If you, you don't have any treatment for Nipahs, no disease-specific treatment. But uh, US Army had developed a monoclonal which was, uh, which was positioned in Australia. And at that juncture, we had to approach uh, the DCGI. We, we, those 15 days until that time when the outbreak lasted, in those 15 days, we had developed uh, an adaptive trial design um, to, to, I think I take pride in the fact that at that juncture, WHO and NIH they were, they were trying to see that they come with us because we were running too fast. We developed that adaptive to clinical trial design because there is a monoclonal. We wanted to test that monoclonal just in case if the virus gets out of hand, we perhaps had no options. But I remember one thing, the rapidity with which the monoclonals were brought from Australia no, it was only about six to eight hours of uh, time that we spent with DCGI. DCGI, Ministry of External Affairs, the customs people, everybody accepted. That perhaps was a good dry run. And by, by 30th, the outbreak had started closing down. And on 4th of uh, June, we received the monoclonals for clinical trial. Now, which essentially means they had some understanding uh, when there is a public health emergency, how to move forwards in a very fast way. So there was some experience that we had. And also the fact that for NIPA, you need a BSL-3 lab where you would perhaps do your testing. Unfortunately, in Kerala, there was no BSL-3 lab. So we had to make shift. BSL-3 lab was created in Nipah, uh, in Kerala. But the challenge was difficult to handle, because we didn't want those who test die just because they got Nipah. So we started developing. There is no test which you can do on site. Point of care test is not available for Nipah. We took the challenge. We developed a point of care test, which was indigenous. And what is most important is we went to DCGI saying that now you approve it. You must remember this was one of those few moments in DCGI where the test was getting approved for the first time 
through DCGI, but USFDA or European authorities or Japanese people, you know, who have different regulatory flavor have not even seen the test. But these two things helped us a lot in trying to understand how regulatory approaches can be changed at the shortest notice. COVID was a sensational uh, thing. When COVID started, <laughs> one of the things that happened was there were no standards <laughs> that were available. Even if you, know, you were to validate RT-PCR test, what do you call a test as a positive test, a negative test? Nothing was known. No. One of the things which we had to do, this had to be done in uh, uh, consultation with DCGI, because DCGI is an authority which will approve kits subsequently, based on what we say. So we used to sit together with DCGI, Dr. Somani uh, himself, and try to evolve those standards. What was also important, in this, this was something which was a stark reality, because uh, USF, US FDA had its only a minor guidance. Even WHO could not guide at that particular juncture. Now, one of the things which we had to do was also try to look at diagnostic kits. Which kits to approve? <laughs> you, you know, they are going to market those kits, and they had no clue because this was a new, new infection. Generally, ICMR used to provide them what should be the sensitivity and specificity of a particular kit which should be approved. But all of us were learning. <laughs> DCJI also was learning. He tried to, tried to understand the intricacies and then we developed standards as to how the kits will be approved because kits came very rapidly by our manufacturers. You know, when we announced that we would like to have new kits, you know, mainly because the kits had become so costly. It was a global market. There were only pro people who were producing it from South Korea and China. And everybody wanted those kits. The prices of those kits had actually skyrocketed like mad. Initially, what we paid for those tests used to be, used to be really tough at that juncture. Then look at the drug trials that came. You will suddenly find that when drug trials, because people wanted to test whether it is Ayurvedic people, <laughs> whether it is our own people who were looking at repurposed drugs. No, one issue that tends to come is they should be approved by DCGI. The trial protocol has to be approved by DCGI. The second issue that used to come was uh, how rigorous can this scrutiny be when we did not know whether these drugs work. And therefore, you suddenly find that things started changing. You know, initially, it was drug, drugs which were, which were challenging DCGI's approvals per se. One of the main reasons was, so far, AIDS or HIV disease had actually led to a revolution in the evidence that you generate we should be used to say whether the whether that drug should be approved or a trial is really strong, are the designs really good. But suddenly when COVID came, you don't have that opportunity because it was rapidly trans transmitting infection. It was spreading so fast since it was droplet infection. We had to somehow manage to find out how do we provide some kind of drug which could be useful. And at that juncture, one of the things that we had to heavily used was unmet need <laughs> section. No, but today, when you reflect, even in unmet need, there is, there, is, there is some room to change certain categories as to when do you say it is an unmet need and what conditions do you put when an unmet, unmet need tends to come, even if it is public health emergency. If you, if you recall, the other challenge that DCGI had to face was emergency use authorization. Now in emergency use authorization, one of the things which we need to remember is informed consent is necessary. But taking informed consent when the pandemic is on, probably doctors could not have done anything. 
so they changed the category. The name was changed. It was restricted use authorization, a term which never existed. But pandemic forced us to think. And perhaps we'll need to think more as to how we will change if such a, such a thing tends to happen subsequently. Now, if you look at the regulator, researchers also had major limitations. What was the major limitation? You know, if you recall, for every variant, the wave used to last for two or three months' time. Two or three months' time. Now, when it lasts for two or three months' time, before you, know, you might recruit many people, you would suddenly find that that particular wave has already disappeared. The result was there used to be incomplete trials. You know, was a part of whether it was drug trial, whether it was a vaccine trial, or whatever. And though adaptive trial design was used, in most of the studies that were conducted, you would find that even that adaptive trial uh, approach, that it would be faster, uh, quicker, that could not be seen because, because of the nature of this particular outbreak. Now, one must remember there were accelerated trials. Globally, what was happening was people used accelerated trial design. And just imagine the regulator, how he would handle these accelerated uh, trials per se. Most often, there were parallel trials that were taking place. You had animal toxicity studies being done parallelly, and phase one and two <laughs> also occurring parallelly. And there was no other way. You could not have it reduced the time, whether it was for vaccine trial. Most often, it was for vaccine trial. And the result was you found that uh, as a regulator, if you sit at such a position, it becomes extremely difficult. But now is the time. Now we, we can actually work over how to conduct trials in an emergency situation when it comes to public health emergency. Now, if you, what was the pressure? The pressure was almost a year had gone by and we didn't have vaccine. No. Our vaccine developers had developed, Covaxin was developed, I think, sometime in June. And the first phase one started some, sometime around September. And they could only end up up to phase two by the time, uh, by the, time the vaccines were approved. Now, you look at Covishield. You know, Covishield was developed earlier, but it had a major glitch. <laughs> the glitch was, a small proportion of patients or the enrollees, uh, participants, had received lower dose uh, in those particular trials for approval. But unfortunately, that was overlooked because of public, uh, public health emergency. And we had to approve both the drugs and uh, both the vaccine, vaccines per se. But think of one issue. The logic that you had to use was not based on efficacy but they had to use immunogenicity data. Assuming that immunogenicity would be perhaps something which would, be, which would have had been seen if efficacy <laughs> uh, trials were completed per se. Now, these are challenges. No? This is something which we need to think now as to how we can actually try and refine our own uh, um, uh, regulations in terms of that. And therefore, you find there are many vaccines you know, where you do not know the efficacy at all. There, <laughs> there is nothing in public. No, I would not name, name them because, of, because it's not very fair, but most of you can perhaps read across. The same happened with, uh, you know, they, uh, why all this was a major worry, main because, you know, you have to remember the social media was a very powerful tool. No, they, they kept on push, pushing DCGI or even researchers to a larger extent, and they had to handle this pressure all the time. One of the other lacunae that you might remember that there was in one of the vaccine uh, trial centers uh, that was in Bhopal, there was a complaint that uh, it was unethical there were side effects which were not, uh, not uh, clearly documented. 
But could DCGI do anything more there? No. Because DCGI's office has so few people <laughs> and the load of work that they have is immense. No, it is time. No, perhaps we have to invest in HR for DCGI at this juncture, uh, uh, at this time point. Now, when it comes to kit validation, was it a simple task for uh, ICMR or even DCGI? Perhaps not. No, we used to do validation our own way. We used to say either you send it to NIV or and we had a network of labs where we had allowed them to get testing done for validation. The unfortunate part was every manufacturer used to believe my product is the best. No, they would come and fight with you, whether you are in ICMR, whether you are in DCGI. And that pressure, no, but we had to ensure that we stayed together with our own criteria of uh, uh, validation per se. Now, what has happened in short? No, today, if you actually reflect, no, the initial days for regulatory authorities were bad enough. But as the time passed by, perhaps regulatory authorities started exercising all their controls. They found out what were the loopholes. They insisted on evidences, and their delays started coming up in approvals uh, at that juncture. What we need to do today is try to document how things happened, how we could move ahead, and what should be my guidelines, regulatory guidelines that I can adopt. The last issue that I would come to, since Dr. <laughs> Gurpur put me in a tight spot when I, I'm not a regulator, but uh, two questions which she said, concurrent uh, enrollment in studies. No? When it comes to that, the generally, no, this becomes an issue in drug or vaccine trials. Because essentially what will happen is there is a fear of drug-drug interaction. Normally, one of the reasons why people may go into both trials could be the financial reimbursement that they provide. Fortunately for us, our people don't pay the way they pay in US <laughs> to each participant. The third thing which is important is when you recruit, at that time, it is our duty, you know, the counselor who sp should speak with the participant, potential participant, that he should explain why this person should not have, you know, should not be going in another trial or whether it is drug or vaccine trial. That reasoning has to be understood by the person. If we don't, ex we don't tell them, they will never understand. Actually, one of the best things that we need to remember, in every trial or in every study, one line has to be written in the consent form. Would concurrent uh, enrollment in different study, would, would it be permitted? Is it not permitted? That will perhaps help. And with respect to penalty, to my mind, penalty is regressive. <laughs> it's not a, not a good approach per se. Though for short, short term, the impact could be good. But I think we need to be progressive and explain to people. That would perhaps work the best in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, sir.